how did Gold Bay come to be? Did I know the story ahead of time? And uh, uh, in the beginning, my mind was simply blank. Uh, that's not exactly true. I actually had three goals. Uh, one was to write a, a fun book, an exciting uh, book with a gripping plot and um, engaging characters, the sort of book I like to read. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my second goal was to write about the Bay Area, to uh, explore the, um, the uh, mosaic of subcultures around the Bay, as well as to do my best to um, explore the magic, the, the natural beauty of the Bay. And third, I, as, I, as I've attempted in all my writing, um, I wanted to try to incorporate a thread, a, a subcurrent um, of both something down to earth and uplifting. And um, so, <clears throat> Uh, for a gripping plot, I turn to, uh, well, the real world and the headlines. And uh, in my first book, uh, Whitewater, a Thriller, I, uh, you need bad guys to have a gripping plot. And so uh, the bad guys were a drug cartel. And uh, so I stuck with, uh, with drug cartels. I read more about a drug cartel. I did some research. Uh, quite a bit more research, and uh, for instance, some, some tidbits. Uh, today, uh, in parts of Mexico, um, ordinary people, pretty much anyone with a salary, with a steady income, such as teachers, such as avocado farmers, are subject to having to pay protection money to their local cartel, simply in order to be left alone. And another little uh, chunk of kind of a window into the world of cartels, how they operate, is summed up in the phrase plata o plomo, plata o plomo, silver or lead. This was a phrase originally spoken by, uh, it's attributed to Pablo Escobar of the Medellin cartel in Colombia. And uh, he, um, he, would give him, he would give people that choice, uh, judges, police chiefs, um, politicians, and uh, it meant uh, plato pomo, silver or lead, you either accept our bribes and perhaps um, grow rich with a secret Swiss bank account, or you die right now. A horrendous uh, choice, and uh, the insidious dimension of that is that once an official accepts um, the bribes, they are from then on owned completely by the cartel, and they continue to uh, pretend to enforce the law, but in fact, they are enforcing the law only against the competition of the cartel. Meanwhile, they're aiding and abetting and nurturing the cartel, which is in the process of sucking the lifeblood out of the uh, local community. And so, um, with that in mind, I'm going to uh, read you a passage from the book. Um, and it, in the course of this talk, I'm going to share a number of passages, and uh, I'll try to do my best to avoid. Um, do I need this mic? Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Not so close. Not so close. Okay. How's this? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Thanks. <laughs> hey, as we go along, your questions and your feedback, um, and you're stepping in and just giving the talk is very welcome. <laughs> okay, um, so <clears throat> um, I'm going to do my best to avoid spoilers as I, as I read a few passages to you. And so I'm not going to tell you who's, who's the speaker in this, but just uh, understand that a character in the book explained the cartel's ingenious entrepreneurial structure, which was flat with few employees. A vast number of entrepreneurs did the actual drug and human trafficking, kidnapping, extortion, robberies, identity theft, you name it, and paid 20% of their gross to the cartel. In return, they got free money laundering and fencing and the protection afforded by the cartel's vast network of corrupt cops, judges, border and customs agents, prosecutors, lawyers, and politicians. 
And so we're talking about imagining a cartel uh, extending its tentacles into the lifeblood of the Bay Area. Um, so a number of serendipitous things happened in the, uh, in the course of writing this book. Um, uh, one was that I, uh, my, uh, a friend of mine, Tone, who, uh, by the way, I want to welcome all of you here. Um, <laughs> so many wonderful friends. I'm, I'm going to go around and, and, uh, and do that in, again later in the talk here. Uh, anyway, uh, north of the border, cartels tend to use um, juveniles uh, as their lookouts, as their drug mules, and also as their killers, as their hitmen or sicarios, because the laws apply to people under 18 are much more lenient um, and forgiving than those uh, for adults. And um, uh, a, a serendipitous uh, event happened where a friend of mine, Tone, introduced me to a man named Hisham Ali Bob, who at that time was a staff member of the Oakland Youth Nonviolence Program. And um, uh, I learned a lot of, from, from Hisham, including that they had figured out a way to try to lure and, and successfully lure uh, these young juveniles out of their gangs. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a very deadly situation for these young kids. They were very likely to get shot, to die, to wind up in prison. And yet it was hard to, to uh, get them to quit their gang. However, they found that if they could talk to these young kids shortly after they were shot, and in other words, in the hospital within say 36 hours when that pain of the wound was, was real and fresh, they could talk to them, especially if it was a compassionate uh, mentor sort of person. Um, they could also talk the, um, uh, these young kids into leaving their gang. And so it was an extraordinary achievement to be able to do. And kind of with that in mind, um, I, uh, I'm going to quote uh, another passage from the book that reflects uh, that whole aspect of, uh, of cartel activity. All right, so um, in this passage, uh, it's not a spoiler to tell you that Adam is the main point of view character in the book. The, 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 the story is largely told from his point of view. And uh, Vocab is a young boy, 15, and his friend Rashid, 12, age 12, um, they are former hitmen for this cartel that's uh, portrayed in this novel. And, uh, but they're being hunted by the cartel because the cartel doesn't allow anybody to leave the cartel. And also El Matador and El Dragon are honchos of the cartel, which is called La Casa. So here we go. Um, Adam was incredulous. You know my Uncle Peace? Sure do. Me and Vocab got shot bad, see? Rashid pulled up his hoodie sweatshirt to reveal a scar bulging from his little stomach. Peace found us in, in the hospital. The pain was so bad, so bad. Vocab, you and Vocab worked for La Casa? We did, but not now. Peace helped us see. If we stayed working for La Casa, we were on a fast road to more and more pain and prison and death you're up here working you're not <clears throat> you're not up here working as a lookout for la casa no no el matador el dragon la casa put out a contract on me and vocab so you're up here why that's that vocab don't know i'm here but la casa don't let nobody quit they trying to hunt us down and kill us the boy's eyes filled with tears. They never gonna let us alone. We'll never be free unless I kill him. So, a little glimpse into the, uh, the plot of the story. 
Um, so an, another uh, amazing kind of um, thing happened, amazing in my mind. Uh, one of the Lake Ridge Club members invited me along on a meth bust in Oakland. And uh, <clears throat> I found myself in a squad room in the Oakland Police Department, a bunch of police officers planning this bust. They planned out every detail from how uh, eight, or, uh, eight or so squad cars would all converge on the meth house and surround it, and uh, exactly who would bust down the door with what they called the key, which is a battering ram, and planned out every detail. And in the midst of this meeting, the sergeant in charge turned to me and he said, so Bill, this is a dangerous neighborhood, but you need to stay across the street during this bust, and you probably won't get robbed. And uh, so I thought, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's good. I probably won't get robbed. And so anyway, the bust uh, unfolded um, <clears throat> largely as, as planned, pretty amazing. And um, once they uh, had the whole place locked down, everybody in handcuffs and so on, um, uh, Demetrius came and walked me through the whole place and showed me what they found and so on. Very interesting. The thing that I remember most from that, that impressed me the most, was just how courteous and how kind these police officers were. Not just to one another and to the public, but to the people they were arresting. Being very careful when they put them in the squad cars and, and so on. I mean, they were, they were exemplary humans. And so they had something going among themselves. There was something, there was a spirit of, uh, not being an out-of-control cop, but being, you know, a public servant. And so I was so impressed by that. And I'm going to read you a passage here that reflects this, but it also uh, uh, takes a little poetic license and attributes the inspiration to a character of mine. <laughs> and so just bear in mind, the, the Oakland police are already on this path without my, without my participation or with the participation of my character. Anyway, and uh, this, this passage uh, is uh, spoken by um, a black Oakland police officer whose name is BC. BC paused, studied Adam, then leaned forward with even more intensity. What's really wild, I can hardly believe it myself, Adam, peace is changing the mindset of the Oakland police. He's doing the ride-alongs, taking part in squad room meetings and narc squad busts. The guy's amazing, who he is, his presence, his compassion. Instead of the old us versus them mindset, peace is helping us see it's all us, like a Vulcan mind now inside the department, we're getting it together. And also with the community, we're connecting, we're seeing things from the other guy's point of view. This all sounded far-fetched. After all, they were talking about Adam's goofy Zen Buddhist flower child Uncle Peace, but BC definitely had Adam's attention. All right. So um, uh, perhaps the, the research for this book, in a way, um, I love you guys. You guys are fantastic. I love the, the smiles I see out there. Thanks for being here again. Um, so, really, my lifetime of growing up in the Bay uh, infused, uh, informed the, uh, this book in so many ways. For instance, um, there's a little passage about that reflects uh, remembering um, an incident that happened when I was, uh, uh, thank you, um, when I was sailing uh, <coughs> uh, a tipsy sailing canoe around the bay with my brother. Um, and when you think of a tipsy canoe and a sail, those shouldn't go together, they don't go together. But it was the best boat we had, the only boat we had, so we used that to sail around the bay and we're just plain lucky to survive. On another occasion, uh, some high school friends and I sailed um, through the night, took all night long, sailed from Marin to Brooks Island, which is right off the coast of um, uh, Richmond, and uh, we crossed the shipping lanes, we saw these ships going by in the night. Well, we were just plain lucky not to get run over. And uh, so, um, then later I, I was a skipper with the Trade Wind Sailing Club, which Al was part of, 
and um, uh, uh, sail all over the bay and so on. One of the things that really struck me and uh, was something that happened a number of times when I sailed what's called the slot. Sailors in the bay know about the slot. It's the zone of the bay that extends from Golden Gate Bridge in the west uh, across to the bay to the shore of Berkeley on the east side of the bay. <coughs> and the, the, uh, the other uh, <coughs> borders of this thing they call the slot are the northern shore of San Francisco and the southern shore of Angel Island, a big rectangle there where the high winds tend to occur, uh, the currents are strong, uh, the fog is most dense, and the shipping is very busy. So you have those four things. All of those are navigation challenges. And uh, so it makes a very exciting place to sail. And, and as a result, for instance, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the windsurfers and the kite boarders like to launch off the shore of Chrissy Field, which is the northern shore of um, the Presidio, and they like to tack back and forth across the slot just inside the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, one of the things I saw many times was how they would swarm and play chicken with the big ships. And so big container ships, maybe a quarter mile long, 200 feet wide, are picking up speed, they're throwing up a bow wave that's 20 feet high, they are going, time is money, they're going, there's no way to stop, they're, they're screaming out the gate, and these fools on their, on their windsurfers and their kiteboards time their passing, time their crossing, so they cut right across the bows of these big ships, so close that if they were to fall, which happens frequently, to fall in the water, it's not a big deal to fall in the water normally because you can recover and get, get back up and start sailing again. But they would cut so close that if they fell, if they fell right when they were passing in front of the ship, there wouldn't be time for them to get back going. And they would be run over and chopped to smithereens by the propellers of these ships. And thank God I never saw anybody fall right in front of these, of these ships, but I saw them play chicken over and over. And this made its way into the book in the form of something called the Bay Way. And I'll let you discover that for yourselves. But uh, the passage I'm gonna, the next passage I'm gonna share with you uh, <clears throat> is uh, my intention is to, uh, well, share something of the beauty of the Bay and, and uh, to hopefully heighten the reader's awareness of, of uh, this beautiful place we live in. So, um, at first light, the surface of Richardson Bay, and that's a, a, a bay off of the main bay over near Sausalito. At first light, the surface of Richardson Bay glistens smooth and calm, riding an incoming tide, wavering ribbons of glassy water, meandered across a vast black carpet of tiny waves swells from the first San Francisco-bound ferry of the morning, gently rocked dream voyager. That's Adam's boat. The fog of the day before had disappeared. In the distance, lights of cities encircling the bay glowed, and cars streamed across the Golden Gate and Bay Bridges, another day going for the gold. And we skipped down, leaving the shelter of the Marin headlands Adam felt a breeze wafting in through the gate. After scanning the shipping lanes to make sure he would not be run over by any more big ships traversing the bay at 20 knots, he pointed the bow into the wind, unzipped the sail cover, and punched the winch button to, to send the mainsail racing up the 100-foot mast. Marveling at the full, sensual, curving shape of the sail, what could be more beautiful? He killed the engine, adjusted the main sheet line, and soon, on a broad reach, leaving Alcatraz well to port, Dream Voyager knifed through the waves, headed for the northern shore of San Francisco. As he neared the shoreline, he felt a deep humming energy reverberate out over the water, like a great hive awakening. All right. 
So, um, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I was able to, uh, to touch on and to explore many of the uh, subcultures that surround the Bay, uh, Marin, uh, Silicon Valley. I, I explore Silicon Valley in the form, th kind of through the means of uh, uh, a billionaire named Harry Bellicosi who's patterned after uh, Larry Ellison, and a combination of Larry Ellison, Steve Jobs, the founders of Google. Uh, I'll just share with you something about, some things that you might not know about Larry Ellison. Um, he actually does own the Golden Gate Yacht Club, which shows up in the book. Uh, he bought that when he got kicked out of the more prestigious yacht club next door, St. Francis Yacht Club. Um, he does own one of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, he bought PeopleSoft and a, ho and a hostile takeover, much to the chagrin, much to the chagrin of uh, the staff of PeopleSoft. Um, he, he does have a mansion in Woodside. I actually met the contractor of that uh, mansion. And he, uh, he is the... Um, uh, he, he's, he's the collector of magnetic sculptures, stone sculptures, that are from a tributary of the Yuba River. Uh, as a longtime uh, outfitter in California, one time I was scouting out access to the lower Yuba below Englebright Dam, and I tracked down a, a property owner I needed to cross his land to launch boats, and so I got to know him, and. It turned out he owned this land, but you know there was no real income from the land until he started mining these boulders, which are about as big as a big Volkswagen. And uh, he would he had, a, he had this big saw that had about a 20 foot diameter blade, and he would cut these boulders into slabs and sell them to Silicon Valley uh, tech guys, including Larry Ellison. And so. I think that that's pretty much, this is pretty much um, the first word of this leaking out into the world of, of, his, uh, of his magnetic uh, stone. Anyway, uh, that's, that's part of the book. Um, of course, I, I talk about Oakland and both its troubles, but also I try to uh, represent the positive things that are going on in Oakland as well. Uh, the, the, these monumental street murals, um, uh, the kind of craftsmen, uh, craftsmen and, and uh, uh, amazing creativity that's going on there. Uh, for instance, a, uh, a Trojan horse, one of our Lake Ridge Club members, Chris Webb, um, built a horse for Burning Man there that was a giant monumental uh, Trojan horse, uh, 40 feet tall. That shows up in the book. Uh, <clears throat> and also, of course, the, the vibrant uh, food scene and so on around Jack London Square. Uh, how many people know where Albany Bulb is? Albany Bulb? Albany Bulb. Okay, well, not everybody, but some people do. Um, well, it's a peninsula that juts into the bay uh, from the shore of Albany. And um, uh, it, it was a, a homeless encampment for a number of years. It was also the scene of um, uh, uh, full moon witches coven rituals. And I thought, what better place to have a, uh, a zany cult have its meetings? And so that's what happens there in the novel. And uh, uh, I also wanted to include our fair town of El Sobrante uh, in the story. And um, uh, I, I, uh, for me, um, and I'm embellishing here, of course, but uh, for me, El Sobrante represents a sanctuary, a place of friendship. Uh, and kindness, and so um, I'm going to share with you a passage that reflects that. Adam focused on his immediate destination, El Sobrante, the town where he had lived with his Uncle Peace from ages 5 to 18. Nestled in the East Bay Hills in a grass slope valley between Richmond and Orinda, the low-key town of El Sobrante which means the leftover in Spanish, was, or used to be, insulated from the frenzied tech boom zeitgeist that permeated the rest of the Bay Area. Perhaps because the property values and hence rents and mortgage payments were lower here, people felt less driven, more relaxed. 
Adam pondered how the town's relative calm, combined with its being surrounded by the vibrant culture of the Bay Area, made El Sobrante a natural sanctuary for writers, thinkers, teachers, and a variety of souls plying roads less traveled. Unlike many parts of the Bay Area, in El Sobrante was still self-evident that the latest hot new restaurant or the next big new thing was less important than one's own inner life. Here, there was less craziness, more time to cultivate relationships, and space to carve out a life in touch with one's own heart, one's own soul. Here, people could actually hear one another talk in restaurants. Suddenly, from nowhere, came the thought, not much longer. All right. Um, uh, there's also scenes that happen right here at the Lake, Lake Ridge Club in the book, but I will let you d d discover those for yourself. And, uh, um, uh, well, I was thinking of going one by one around and thanking each person and praising each person, and so maybe I should do that. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, I think uh, I want to just say thank you so many of you played a role in helping me create this book, and I really appreciate you. And uh, so thanks so much. And um, so just look around you and know that you're surrounded by great souls, and you are a great soul. And so on that note, actually, I'm going to, um, uh, uh, we're going to soon have a toast. But uh, before we jump into that, there's, there's a passage here that includes a toast in, built into the, into the, uh, into the very passage, so we're gonna we're gonna hear the hear the passage and and, and toast as we hear it. Um, all right. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to uh, uh, conclude with a uh, with a final little quotation from the book, and I'm not gonna to avoid spoilers. I'm not gonna say who's speaking here, but um, this is, the intention of this is to be part of that. Uh, that third goal, which is to have something uplifting uh, in the midst of this uh, gripping thriller. So, this character, um, who, like everyone else, had been enjoying the wine, let loose. Well, a little something I've learned is that all of us have within ourselves direct access to the wellspring of universal energy, unlimited awareness, full, perpetual access to the Creator. Each of us is, now and always, whole, okay, and where it's at. <laughs> so, there's, there's more to come of that, of that little passage, but um, let's, let's, let's toast to that. We are whole, okay, and where it's at. <laughs> Everybody is. All right. So <clears throat> the speaker paused, beaming. There were shouts of skull and amen. Everyone lifted their glass in a toast, then fell silent again, hanging on every word. You don't need to yearn to be fixed or to be anywhere other than where you are, he continued. To have such yearnings is only human, of course, but when these yearnings come up, simply take notice without thinking they are truly from your essence. They may indicate you are sad or need nurturing or that it would be good for you to do something for yourself, but you are not the yearning or the sadness or the neediness. You are the space where these things flow through. You are presence. You are life force. You are the creator. As Rumi says, it is your light that lights the world. All right. Should we cheer having a skull? <laughs> <laughs> it is your light that lights the world. <laughs> <laughs>